I'm Dr. Jennifer Robinson, and these are my co-moderators from our exciting late-breaking clinical trial session this morning. Hi, my name is Samia Mora. I'm a cardiologist at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. And I'm Alan Brown. I'm uh, the immediate past president of the National Lipid Association and with Advocate Aurora Health in Chicago. So the first, uh, I think, very interesting uh, session or presentation was on a study looking at mechanisms perhaps explaining those phenomenal results from the REDUCE-IT trial with icosapentethyl. Yeah, so the first study was evaporate, and that was actually looking at uh, coronary CTA uh, presented by Dr. Budoff. Uh, and they looked at about um, 40 people uh, uh, with CTA to look to see if there, you know, if the effect was from reducing low attenuation plaque. So I thought it was interesting because the primary endpoint of the trial um, for evaporate, not for reduce, but for evaporate, um, was not significant. Um, but there were some other suggestive secondary endpoints that seemed to go in the right direction. But what's most notable, I thought, was that it did not reverse plaque in either arm. It was actually it did slowing. Not evaporate right, plaque. it did not <laughs> evaporate plaque. It, it reduced the progression, but did not evaporate the plaque in either arm. It was yeah. a small study. Yeah, my, my impression was it was a small study, and uh, they, they haven't completed it yet. Mm -hmm. So they presented interim data, and they didn't hit their primary endpoint. But one part of the data that I thought was very interesting was looking at mineral oil versus a cellulose right. uh, placebo and not showing really any deleterious effects right. from mineral oil, which is certainly interesting from a coronary CTA. Right, because we were concerned that, you know, maybe it was over uh, estimating the effect of icosapentethyl, but it looks like it could all be due to icosapentethyl and, uh, and perhaps have a significant effect on slowing plaque progression, which would be important in this population. In my mind, I still think there are other mechanisms. It's going to be pleiotropic effects, you know. Yeah, there are uh, many effects. Actually, right. we presented some data about icosanoids, which are the lipid, bioactive lipid mediators, and um, it's a small sub-study in vital, but there was significant, re you know, change in the downstream mycosinoid mediators. Right, so decrease in inflammation and I think right. also probably a, it's kind of an anticoagulant effect. There's that little hint At for the bleeding high there, right, so maybe yeah. kind of an aspirin-like effect. Yeah. So I guess stay so tuned. Very interesting. I'll be looking forward to when they actually complete the trial Absolutely. to see if uh, with a little more time we'll see some. And of course there's a second omega-3 trial going on called STRENGTH, which is carboxylated EPA, DHA, DHA but at high also. doses also. Right. So there's a, still a lot of excitement uh, yeah. yet to come. And what did you think, Jennifer, of the second part of the session that was the RNA therapeutics? Dan Reeder gave us a great introduction to that session, and there were a few trials presented, um, the APOC3 sRNA inhibitor, the ANG uh, PDL3 inhibitor, and also the Orion 9 that was presented uh, for familiar. Well, I mean, first of all, just this exciting, you know, gene therapy era that we're entering here. Um, yeah, we're you entering know, the and, 21st and century. Right, right, you know, kind of very targeted yeah. therapy, targeting Orion, very specific and very you know, in, this, in the case of especially in Clusaran, very potent mechanism for inhibiting PCSK9 synthesis. So, uh, you know, it's kind of, we're kind of, I'm kind of getting LDL fatigue now because like, you know, it's just another great trial showing PCSK9s <laughs> reduce LDL 50% on top of background therapy. So I, I think that's, that's going to be filed at the end of this year. And so, you know, hopefully next year we'll have it available uh, in Clusaran for us in the clinic. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I also was excited about the ANCH-PTL3 and the APOC3 uh, small inhibiting messenger RNA drugs because I think that uh, there's a real need for our chylomicronemia patients. So they're really severe hypertriglyceridemic patients with recurrent pancreatitis other than going on an extremely low-fat diet, which is moderately effective in some patients. Uh, we have Volanosaurcin, which is still awaiting FDA mm -hmm. approval. And that's so the ASO uh, antisense. Right, against that's against antisense against APOC3. So this is a different mechanism. Um, we don't see the platelet drop that we did see mm -hmm. in some of the Volanosaurcin patients. And uh, we have right, two they more. Safe. They seemed, at least from those phase one, 2A studies that were presented today, they seemed well tolerated. Right, so but the good news is there's two more options. And uh, I'm I have several patients waiting for an option. I'm very excited to see that uh, maybe we'll be at least be able to get them into a trial while yeah. we're waiting. And I think the point, it, we see with Inclusion, you know, twice a year therapy as, you know, as an option. 
uh, and, and it looks like these drugs are also going to be, they had, you know, one, one injection had a right, for 16 prolonged weeks or uh, so suppression. Or so I think for those patients, as was pointed out by the presenter, you know, it's going to be really helpful and for adherence and all sorts of things for, for patients yeah. to try. I thought it was also interesting to compare the ANGE PTL3 with the APOC3 because they both reduce triglycerides quite a bit, mm -hmm. um, you know, by, uh, by 60 percent up to 90 percent. Um, with APOC3 inhibitor more than the ANGPTL3 reducing triglycerides and BLDL cholesterol. But I thought it was interesting the HDL cholesterol That's differed. Different. So the ANGPTL3 mm -hmm. um, reduced the HDL cholesterol a little bit, not much, but it was in the order of 12 to 20 percent, and uh, depending on the dose. And the, the APOC3 inhibitor actually increased the HDL right. cholesterol. Right. So yeah, whether or not that has clinical relevance is. It'll be interesting because we know that both of those drugs have other effects beside uh, lipoprotein lipase inhibition. They affect hepatitis lipase in the liver and, uh, and and many other pathways, yeah. particularly. In fact, we don't really know exactly their their precise way there that could be uh, good for cardiovascular disease. I mean, we know they have all these effects, right, Alan? But do we know which of them is the predominant? No, I, I think you know that probably the predominant pathway that affects lipids, other than the HDL, is the it's lipoprotein the lipase uh, suppression. But they definitely have other effects even beyond lipids. So it'll be very interesting to see what pans out in the longer term right, trial. Right, right. But very exciting. And, and the good news is we have genetic knockout mutations. Right. For the both. genetic data is very strong for both. And it doesn't okay. seem to show any deleterious effects of not having uh, APOC3 or ANGPTL3. So I think that's But, but I'd say the caveat, though, is these are still data blood levels done on middle-aged people yeah, that these are, are healthy alive. volunteers to, <laughs> right. to, yeah, and so it's while well, a lifetime of exposure to modest changes due to genetics su supports a causal pathway it says not uh, as much as we need to know about acute lowering with drugs and also the adverse effects of either the drug itself or uh, off-target effects of, of that lowering that molecule yeah. so There'll yeah. still be a lot of research needed. Yeah, and we I need think. the outcomes uh, right. trials. With right. These were just really phase one, right. two A, right. uh, except for Orion, which was phase three, but but looking at LDL and other it, and, and to a well established target. Yes, yes. So yeah, that because that we know that surrogates <laughs> are not <laughs> not the same as the clinical right. endpoints. Right. Yeah, so yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, the one nice thing about the uh, Orion data is that. We know that about half of patients are actually off their medications at a year. Yeah. So Sad having uh, such a long duration and then potentially, you yeah. know, uh, twice a year dosing, uh, that might help us with making sure patients are actually taking their drugs. And as yeah. my father used to say, uh, the worst drugs are ones that don't work or the patient doesn't take. Right. So it'll be interesting to see, you know. W what w how we could model event reduction with a right. drug. Sort of like a vaccine in a way, except it's not permanent. Absolutely. You have to get it twice a year. That's a great well, That kind of brings us to the final trial uh, presented today, which was uh, a trial in stroke patients performed in France with uh, some sites in South Korea as well. Um, and they wanted to test LDL goals for the first time in a, in a clinical trial. You know, we in the 2013 guidelines, we focused on statin therapy because that's how the trials were done. Uh, so they decided to test goals, and so they had uh, randomized patients to either an LDL goal of 100 or less than 70. And they uh, actually took a really long time to enroll and ran out of money and stopped early. So they were about 30% uh, uh, short of their primary endpoint. But they st nonetheless still showed it's a 22% reduction uh, in, in cardiovascular events. So I think it, it, it supports, yes, it's better to have an LDL less than 100 and to continue to intensify therapy. I, you know, having gotten, been partially responsible for getting rid of LDL goals, I'd hate to see us go back because I think we end up in, gives us some wrong answers, but at least it supports, I think, intense, you know, high intensity statins and, and adding azetamide, azetamide, right, azetamide, uh, azetamide to at least get that 50% reduction as recommended now in the 2018 mm -hmm. guidelines. I'm going to throw you a bone, Jennifer, okay. because you were partially <laughs> responsible for getting rid of goals, but you were also responsible for the concept of thresholds, which is a critical concept. And it, it's easy to explain that if you come in with an acute infarct and your LDL is 72, and your goal is 70, and if you lower the patient to 69, you've achieved your goal, but what have you done for that patient? Nothing, right? You've got from 72 to 69. 
whereas a threshold, which is your concept, I don't know that you get credit for it, is a number above which you add aggressive therapy, something that's been proven in a trial to make a significant re uh, reduction in risk. No matter where you start, you want to get a minimum of a 50% LDL reduction in a high-risk individual. But if your LDL is still over 100 or over 70, we could argue, then you should add additional therapy. So that, yeah. that's kind of the way most of us practice. And, yeah. uh, and I thought, especially like the t treating to stroke, tar stroke to target, um, as you said, Judge, but this is really the only trial that has tested for clinical outcomes whether a strategy really of lowering LDL cholesterol more aggressively, comp you know, less than 70 versus uh, less than 100. And these were, I think, uh, very special population because these are stroke patients. They had 15% TIA, but they were mostly stroke patients. And, um, uh, and we know only from one prior trial, Sparkle, that there was about a 16% relative risk reduction with, with statin, uh, one dose that was atorvastatin versus placebo. So now we have another trial randomized. It wasn't blinded, um, but the adjudication, I think, was blinded. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but, but still pretty impressive, 22% relative risk yeah, reduction. But on the other hand, they did find a hint that there was an increase of hemorrhagic stroke, which Small, has always yeah, been our concern yeah. with low LDL levels. So it was interesting they saw this in this trial where we haven't really seen it in the PCSK9 yeah. trials and CVD Sparkle, populations. I think they did see it yeah. Right, and yeah. so is it something about the stroke population that's particularly susceptible? I kind of like the idea uh, when I'm trying to move people toward thinking. You know, once we get LDLs below 100, which is supported by this trial, and it, you know, you get the total mortality benefits, the cardiovascular mortality benefits, getting LDL below 100. After that, though, I would say. Maybe you don't want to do more LDL lowering when LDLs are, you know, around 72. Uh, you've got a lot of options, right? You've got a icosapentethyl if they're diabetic. You can ask an, add an SGLT2 or a, you know, a GLP1. There's a lot of options. Uh, or, mm -hmm. you know, colchicine. Now we learn that uh, generic colchicine may be, you know, an ACS I, I patient. So we have lots of, lots of, you know, I think that's our struggle is what do you do next because we can't add all of them and I think that's what we're going to be yeah. wrestling with now in this next yeah. cycle. Of that's guidelines. exciting, right, Jennifer? We, and Alan, we have now all these, you know, potential options that well, we can We use. do. And it's exciting and confusing at the same time, right? <laughs> if you have a diabetic with coronary disease, there are nine different, yeah. maybe ten different drugs we could add. I do I think, however, that maybe there isn't any global message about not lowering LDL below 100. I, I suspect since we have 28,000 patients in 4EA and we've got a huge group in, uh, in the Odyssey Outcomes who've got very low LDLs and we didn't see the signal of intracranial bleed, though it was much shorter trials, that there may be susceptible individuals. And secondly, we could clearly see that there are subgroups of people that seem to be high enough risk where getting their LDL even lower may right, get benefit. Right. So, so my thought would be we need to get better at identifying mm -hmm. who we may cause harm and right. who we're going to get benefit and identify those patients who are going to get the most benefit right. rather than kind of a broad swath, get everybody to And I would say the most mm -hmm. benefit for dollar expended because all these therapies are quite expensive and there's limited health care dollars, how can we spend those most effectively and reduce the most events and improve people's quality of life and mm. everything. So heading towards more uh, precision-based approaches yeah. with a wide variety of, of options uh, and waiting the exciting outcomes trials that are ongoing. So okay. a lot right. to look forward Stay to. Stay tuned, AHA next year. <laughs> Thanks for watching.